Uh, so how's everyone doing? Okay, before I get started, I, I want to have a, 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 a seamless uh, uh, experience here. So I've got code, and I'm going to live code it towards the end of the talk. Is that readable in the back row? Okay. Is, is that readable in the back row? Excellent. Thank you. So uh, how's everyone doing today? Good? So uh, I actually have been cramming for my talk all morning, and I haven't been to a session yet. Uh, because I'm a prepared professional. And, uh, and uh, so this is the first time I've been in one of the rooms, and the music's awesome. <laughs> I'm an old rocker, so I really like it. So anyhow, so uh, welcome to the talk. Uh, it's called What's Old is New Again? An Introduction to WebAssembly. Uh, I, I threw that little What's Old is New Again in there because uh, assembly and uh, microprocessors and that kind of stuff is sort of an old idea. And um, WebAssembly is kind of a new idea, but it's it's a reimagining of an old idea. And so it's sort of one of those sort of cycles that you tend to see repeating uh, in, our, in our industry. So um, my name is Guy Royce. Uh, I'm a developer evangelist with Data Robot. Uh, we're based in Boston, Massachusetts. And we have an automated machine learning uh, product that we hope you'll check out. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about Data Robot. Um, um, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Guy Royce. Um, if everyone here follows me, I can break the 2K barrier on Twitter, so you should all do that right now. Uh, last time I checked, I was at 1970, and if I get just two more people, it'll be the same as my birth year, so it'd be, that would be okay, too. <laughs> um, the code for these, uh, the, some of the code that I've done around, I've done around WebAssembly can be found uh, at code.guy.dev. Uh, that redirects to my GitHub. And if you want to see my blog that I never update, uh, you can go out to guy.dev. So... Um, am I the only one here that never updates their blog? Does anyone even read blogs anymore? <laughs> I, I just look at feeds and get data. So, but anyhow, uh, check out my stuff. Check out Data Robot. So, what is WebAssembly? Uh, well, um, I asked my computer wife Karen, and uh, she said it was 50% web and 50% assembly. So, uh, uh, but perhaps I watched too much SpongeBob. Um, the actual answer is is that it's a solution to a problem. Uh, and that problem is JavaScript. What the hell, JavaScript? I'm a, I'm a fan of JavaScript. I run the JavaScript user group in my hometown of Columbus, Ohio. And um, I like it. I, I like it unironically. Uh, and I know a lot of people don't like JavaScript. And I can understand why. I mean, look at some of these things we've got here. We've got array is, not, uh, is equal to not array. That's true. What? Uh, not a number is uh, uh, triple equal not a number is false, which maybe can make a little sense. Number dot min value is greater than zero. That has not been my experience with my bank. <laughs> maybe my credit card. <laughs> uh, parse int, you pass in the word fire truck, returns not a number. The most reasonable line of code on this entire slide. Um, fire truck is definitely not a number. However, if you do parse int fire truck comma 16, it returns 15. You might be wondering why I chose the word fire truck. Well, um, I'm thinking of a word and it starts with the letter F and it ends in CK. <laughs> it's fire truck. Uh, my, my son told me that when he was eight years old. So I, I think I'm, I, I'm either winning or losing at parenting, I'm not sure. Uh, but the reason that works is because if you put the comma 16 after it, it says, well, this is, uh, you're parsing a base 16 number, and so f is uh, the value 15 in hex, and the rest of it says, well, those aren't numbers, so I'll just give you the number so far. And so um, that might be okay behavior, but it's a little weird. Uh, my favorite here is actually console.log.call.call.call.call.apply. And uh, call is a function that's on every function, including call. And so you can just chain these things together and invoke functions dynamically uh, in, in JavaScript that way. Um, and then there's math.min is greater than math.max, and that's true. Um, so yeah, JavaScript. Uh, it's the language we all love to hate. It's the language we all have to use as, in some degree or another, because if you're building a web app, hello, JavaScript. But it's not so bad, because if you don't like JavaScript, you can choose another language, 
like JavaScript. Um, I, I know what you're thinking, right? You know, it's like JavaScript's kind of the only game in town when it comes to the browser. But some of you are thinking, well, you know, I like TypeScript. Or um, maybe you're an Elm fan. Uh, there are ways to generate uh, front-end code using something other than JavaScript. Of course, the challenge with that is, is that it generates JavaScript. And uh, you can map that to your original source code, but you still need to know some JavaScript in order to make it work. You can never really get away from it. And the other thing about those tools is that they're so easy to use. Um, this is a random selection of tools that have been popular currently and in the past. Um, I think React's kind of cool, but the fact that I have to have a node package that creates a React project for me feels like failure. It means it's complicated. Um, you just use these, these simple tools, you can have a modern JavaScript environment running up on your computer in four to eight hours. Um, it's actually, I think there's a little uh, bit of, uh, uh, I, I don't know what the word is, but uh, uh, I, I'm projecting a little bit here. I'm, I'm, but well, look at the picture in the background here. How many of these tools in the background are knives? <laughs> Maybe I th I'm thinking things about JavaScript I shouldn't be thinking. So, but there's actually uh, one other problem with JavaScript, and um, I think it's a little more fundamental than it's a quirky language. I mean, the guy who created JavaScript did it in, in like a week. I have never written in a language in a week. Anyone here written a language in a week? Uh, if someone raises your hand, I'm gonna hug you. <laughs> That's just not something typical people do. And so it's actually very impressive. And I, I, we can forgive its uh, foibles, but um, one thing that is intrinsic to Java is that it's a scripting language in a browser. And so we've got to download that language, we've got to download that JavaScript file, and we can minify that file to make it smaller to, to mitigate the problem of downloading it, but you've got to download it. Uh, once we've downloaded it, we've got to parse it into its individual tokens. And then once we've tokenized that, then we've got to run it through a, a, a parse function to build an abstract syntax table, or tree. And then we've got to run that, we've got to execute that tree. And uh, this takes time. And so the thought is, is wouldn't it be great, instead of having to go through these extra steps, if you could compile code for the browser? If you could compile code for your web browser, you could eliminate the uh, tokenizing and the uh, building of that tree, because that's what the compilation does. Um, if you could compile, uh, your tooling could get simpler. M maybe, depends on uh, what, what, lang what you choose. But if you could compile, you could use something other than JavaScript. And I think there's a lot of people in the world that would be very happy about that. Um, part of me would be sad. I kind of want to you know, compile the JavaScript itself, but I don't know that that'll work because it's dynamic, uh, the, the way it's dynamic. But uh, if you could compile code for the browser, that opens up all kinds of doors. And that is exactly what WebAssembly is. Uh, WebAssembly is code compiled to run in your browser. And so, um, I thought it might be worthwhile if we're going to talk about assembly language and WebAssembly. Uh, and WebAssembly, by the way, is slightly misnamed because if you think about how uh, machines used to work, you had machine code, right? And then you had an assembler, and, which assembled assembly language. So WebAssembly is actually you know, web machine code or web byte code. And um, assembly is a language you can use to program in it. And you can use other languages as well. But, um, how many here have ever programmed an assembly language? That's an impressively large number. How many have been paid to do it? That's more like it. <laughs> um, so I, I've uh, programmed an, an assembly language. I'm, uh, I'm 47 years old, and I'm kind of on the young side for having done it. Um, I'm also on the young side for having programmed in COBOL at the beginning of my career, so, uh, so there's that too. But um, a lot of you probably uh, did uh, assembly language programming in university, or maybe you did it because it was uh, fun, <laughs> uh, for very values of fun. <laughs> we'll run that through parsint. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but I thought I'd go super quick, uh, since you guys are fairly well versed in, uh, in this already. I won't, go, I won't belabor this too long, but I got a little bit of a refresher on how this stuff works. So we all know machines only understand ones and zeros. It's, you know, that's like the first thing they teach you when you're, you know, five years old about computers and, hey, it's all ones and zeros, folks. It's like, yeah, it's just very well-organized ones and zeros. 
Um, and uh, those ones and zeros can represent instructions for a microprocessor. So on the left here, I've got an address, uh, an arbitrary address in memory in hex. Uh, so it goes from 200 to 212. I've got a binary representation of a program. That's very hard to read. I have a hex representation of that same program in, in red there in that column. And that's a little easier to read, but it's still not very easy to read. It's easier. And on the far right, we've got assembly language. Uh, this is a 6502 assembly language. And um, that's way easier to read, Ex except it, actually it's kind of not. But it's a lot easier than the hex and a lot easier than the binary. And so if you look at this assembly code here, you can see that um, you've got these, on the left here, you've got these labels, which are sort of like uh, places you can jump to. And you've got jump statements. And so like LDY is load onto the Y register, the value is 0, 0 load onto the X register the value of 0, 0. And you can see here on the hex, A0, 0, 0, load 0, 0 in. Uh, one thing I think is kind of neat about this is that if you look at the jump loop 1, and you look where loop 1 is, it's on line 207. If you look at the jump down here, you can see uh, the uh, big Endian notation there, because it's got the uh, least significant byte first. And so that's kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, this is a little assembly program. Um, it turns out programming assembly is kind of a pain in the butt. And so um, most people don't want to do it. Um, there's a great um, story that I pulled out of a book here from uh, uh, von Neumann who said uh, that uh, he, he was using his grad students to hand assemble um, programs. And so you write the thing out and assemble, and then they would, you know, in assembly, and then they would write all the bytes out, and then they would encode those. And he, uh, one of the students said, well, we're going to build an assembler because that's easier. And he got angry and said, it is a waste of a valuable scientific computing instrument to use it to do clerical work. And I think that's one of the funniest things he's ever said. Because, um, so what kind of applications does everyone work on, right? I, I, I spent 12 years working for an insurance company. That's the definition of clerical work. Everything we do with computers today is clerical work. And it's even gotten worse because, of course, we all watch the uh, obligatory cat videos on the internet. Um, we use these valuable scientific computing instruments to do incredibly trivial things. And so it's kind of funny. Um, his perspective on it. I mean, he's coming from a perspective of scarcity, um, but this is a comment he made in the 70s when it wasn't as scarce it is, as it was when he started. And lots of people were doing assembly. So, uh, but he would be proud of me because the code I showed you earlier is actually the first assembly code I ever wrote. And uh, I actually uh, wrote it on, pa on paper and assembled it by hand and then entered it on a hex keypad on a circuit board. So, um, I thought that was kind of fun. Of course, assembly sucks. It doesn't, but it does. Um, and so people came up with better languages like C and C++ that you could then compile instead of assemble and to get those, uh, those uh, machine instructions instead. And uh, that was great. You could then compile it and run it on your microprocessor. But there was a problem uh, with that, which is that there are a lot of microprocessors. And so you've got um, I, you know, just a plethora of them. So if you would compile it for one machine with one set of instructions, uh, operations, and then you've got another microprocessor with another set of operations, then you run into problems where you've got to compile this thing multiple times. And then you have a um, sort of a proliferation of binaries that need to be distributed. Um, I remember in the early 90s, uh, everyone would compile things for the 8086 architecture. And um, if you had, say, a 486 microprocessor that had all these new instructions, everyone would make binaries that would really, were targeting a lower set. So you couldn't take advantage of everything the microprocessor could do. And uh, the solution to that was the solution that we always use when we run into software problems is uh, we created another layer of abstraction. And so um, this is what Java is. Right? We create a virtual machine that has its own, its own um, operation, its own machine code, its own, which we call bytecode. Or if you're a .NET person, uh, 
They call it intermediate language because uh, bytecode was taken. And um, so we created that layer of abstraction. And this solved lots of problems. It'll let, it let us uh, do just-in-time compilation so that we could um, target the specific microprocessor on our machine and take full advantage of it as opposed to just uh, doing a lowest common denominator sort of compilation. And uh, it allowed us to uh, write code once and, uh, as they say, run everywhere, right? Uh, initially, that was debug everywhere, but now it, it kind of is run everywhere. And uh, that worked pretty well. This is what WebAssembly is. Did I? There we go. Oh, there, there we go. Here's how virtual machines work. So we got our, uh, well, this is Java code now. It's totally different from the C code. And you can tell this is a Java binary because it starts out with cafe babe. So every class file starts with that in, in the first four bytes. And then it runs on the virtual, uh, on, the, on the JVM. And then uh, it translates to the microprocessor. But this is what WebAssembly is doing for us too. But instead of uh, having a virtual machine that's running on your machine as a process and, and accessing, uh, you, taking advantage of that m microprocessor, it's in the browser instead. And uh, we've got really broad support in the browsers. All the major browsers support it. Here we got Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and uh, Edge. Uh, IE is not on that list and will never be. Um, it also supports the mobile versions of these browsers, so you can even do this for mobile stuff, which is actually kind of impressive. And um, it's pretty uh, consistent. I've, I've played with it a little bit and had some trouble getting some of my examples to work properly on Safari, um, which, well, I don't want to say anything mean about Safari. <laughs> um, but I know what I use it for, and that's to download Chrome. Uh, once it's in the browser, there's sort of the model it's, it's working on is you've got these uh, WASM files. And so a, a WASM file is a WebAssembly module. It's a binary file that contains that compiled bytecode. Uh, you can instantiate these from JavaScript. And then once you've instantiated them, uh, you can then treat them as a bag of functions and call functions on them. Uh, you can also, when you instantiate them, hand it a bag of functions written in JavaScript that it can call back on. So you, you can see here, we've got sort of this bi-directional, you can call JavaScript and JavaScript can call it. But you'll notice there's no arrow between WASM and HTML. And that's because uh, WebAssembly does not have the means to manipulate the DOM. It actually doesn't even know what a string is. Which if you think about it makes sense. Um, how are strings implemented in Java? Okay, how are strings implemented in C++? If you need something that can compile to both of these, you need something that's a little more lower level. And so in, in, in C, you know, you, you've got that character array. Um, in Java, it's, I'm sure it's a character array behind the scenes. It's probably very similar behind the scenes, but I, I really don't know. Uh, but it allows the languages that have the string implementation to figure out how to represent them in memory. And that's a challenge that the working group is working on to try and uh, come up with a string standard. But right now it doesn't support strings, no DOM manipulation. There are plans to do this, it's just not there yet. We're at version 1.0, so it's, it's new stuff. But it's cool stuff. Um, but because you've got this import capability, you can do DOM manipulation from WebAssembly, you just have to write bridge functions in JavaScript to do it. So you can write a function in JavaScript that you know, uses uh, you know, document.getElementById and uh, manipulates the DOM that way. And uh, we're going to go down all the way down to the next to the lowest level. I'm not going to go to bytecode because no one wants to see that. But I am going to go down to WebAssembly text format, WAT files. Um, I have a tool that will compile these on my, on my machine called Wabbit, the WebAssembly binary toolkit. Uh, it's a Waskily Wabbit, of course. Um, but we're going to uh, go into uh, what this WebAssembly text format looks like. So here we've got a real simple add function. You can see we've got to define our module up top. We've got a, we're exporting a function called add. And then we've got an implementation of the add function. And if we look at the add function here, right here, we can see that we've got two parameters, $A and $B. And they're both 32-bit integers. And we expect it to return a 32-bit integer. And uh, the virtual machine uh, for WebAssembly is stack-based. 
And so what that means is, is that when we uh, come into our function, when we call the add function, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to call get local dollar a, and that gets our parameter that was passed in and shoves it onto a stack. Then we're going to call get local dollar b, and it's going to take the next parameter and shove it on the stack. Then we're going to call add, and add's going to pop both those values off the stack, and it's going to shove the uh, addition of those two numbers together back onto the stack. Now we're at the end of our function. There's one item on our stack. That's the return value. So that's, that's how a stack-based virtual machine works. Make sense? Good. No one nodded, but I'm going to assume that you did. So um, once you've got these uh, things in place, uh, once you've got a WebAssembly module built, here's the code that you would use to instantiate one. I've got three examples of it here. Uh, example uh, on the top left here is the bad way you shouldn't do. Uh, and what it's doing there is it's uh, fetching the uh, WASM file as just like a, an HTTP request. And then it's, uh, once it gets that returned, it gets the array buffer out of the response. And once it has the array, array buffer, it, gets, um, it then instantiates it. And once it's done instantiating it, you are handed the thing. So you've got this promise chain happening. And this isn't very efficient. Uh, because it can't start parsing as it's downloading. The better way, and the less code way, is down here, where you say uh, instantiate streaming, and then you pass it, um, you pass it the results of a, well, you pass it a thing that will resolve as a promise. And so you pass the fetch, and then the results of that. And so it's less code, it performs better, it's the way to do it. Uh, if um, you want to import functions, and other things into the WebAssembly. So if you want to make things available from JavaScript to the WebAssembly module, you can create an imports object up here. And this is a doubly nested object structure. So it's a dictionary of dictionaries. And you can, or a map of maps. And then you pass that in along with uh, the results of fetch. And then those things will be available to that WebAssembly module. Uh, importing and exporting functions are, is actually pretty simple. This is the JavaScript side of things. Um, in JavaScript, once you have your, um, your WebAssembly module, you literally just say module.instance.exports.function name. It's just a bag of functions. You just call them. And in this case, here's add and subtract. And so it's taking numbers in. For anything that's exported, for the callbacks, for, um, or things that are imported, I'm sorry, uh, we have this uh, object here, that, that double, the dictionary dictionaries, and we just put a function in there. So here's a log callback, and uh, internally we've mapped that to a function called log in the WebAssembly module. So in the WebAssembly text format, we can call that function that we've imported. This is what that looks like on the WebAssembly side. So here in JS, we call .add. In WebAssembly, we're exporting an add function, and there's our implementation. Same thing with subtract. A uh, fairly uh, straightforward implementation. Um, we'll get into the syntax of this stuff more. I'm going to actually live code some of this stuff. Uh, but for the callback, uh, all you have to do is uh, do an import in your uh, WebAssembly text format and uh, say where in that dictionary of dictionaries is located. Give it a local name that uh, WebAssembly can use, and then give it a signature that's expected. And then you use the call function to just then call the imported function inside of WebAssembly. You can also uh, do a, a start. So um, this is a, like a main. So you can say in your WebAssembly, when you're instantiated, start by calling main. And then it can do stuff. Um, a convenient thing you might want to do there is have a WebAssembly module that starts up, at default, starts up as soon as it's instantiated. And when you instantiate it, you hand it a bunch of imports, and so it can start calling back and firing events that it thinks you would care about. And so that gives you uh, sort of a, you can think of it as, you can think of them two ways. You can you kind of do both of these things in, in WebAssembly. You can think of this as sort of a main function uh, that just kicks off your code. Uh, you could also think of it as a constructor. Uh, so that when, you're, uh, when you instantiate these WebAssembly modules, because you can instantiate them multiple times, uh, you can think of it more as a, a, like an object constructor. Yeah, there we go. I'm just highlighting the start part. This is what I get for updating my slides two hours before the talk. 
So, uh, There's also a concept of shared memory. So you'll notice that we're only dealing with integers back and forth. I'm doing just basic math functions. And that's because those are the only types that are available is integers and floats. Uh, that's the only native types that are supported by uh, WebAssembly so far. Uh, but there is this idea of a shared memory area that is shared between JavaScript and WebAssembly. You can actually have multiple WebAssembly modules instantiated in a page, and they can all access the same shared memory as well. And uh, the way this works is it's just an array. It's just a linear, it's just a line of memory. And so uh, in this particular example, uh, we have to import that memory object. JavaScript is instantiating it for us. And in here, I've, uh, for example, hard-coded a value and saying, put at location 0, i32.const0, uh, the value 13. And so that puts the value 13 at that location. You can also use code uh, inside of your WebAssembly uh, to do that as well. Here I'm saying uh, i32const1 is saying at position 1, push that onto the stack. Take the value 23, push that onto the stack. And i32.store8, store an 8-bit number based on what's on the stack. And so that would shove the value 23 into location one in that shared memory array. In JavaScript, you can use these as well. This is, this is why they exist. And so here we've got uh, our instantiation of that memory module, the, the first line there, uh, memory equals new webassembly.memory. We give an initial page size of one uh, pages are, I believe, 64K or 640K. I can't remember which. Um, either way, you'll never need more than that. So, um, said, said Bill Gates. So, um, there's our imports. Yeah, there we go. So, here uh, we're instantiating that memory structure there. And then, uh, once we uh, instantiate uh, the WebAssembly object, this is the same one that we were looking at before. So, it's going to, on main, You'll notice that it had a um, it had a, main, a start main, so this guy bootstraps himself. So in here, once we've instantiated, 13 and 23 get put into memory automatically, and uh, we can access that by taking the buffer on our memory WebAssembly memory object and putting it into UN8 array. And then we can just access them like access them like any other array. So we can say shared sub zero is going to give us uh, the value in position zero. Shared one is going to give us the value in position one. And we can also store things in there. So we can shove the number 42 in position three, and a job, and then WebAssembly will then be able to see that. And so it's a way of getting data back and forth. And one thing you can use this for is to store strings. So in here I've got a little uh, hello world application. Uh, I'm using emojis, you know, so I got a waving hand and uh, a globe. And you'll notice the slash zero zero right there. Uh, that is null terminating that string. So we're kicking it old school here with uh, the C, C syntax. Uh, and so uh, that is storing into uh, that memory object a, a UTF-8 encoded string into these uh, uh, 13 bytes, 12 bytes really, but 13 bytes. And then in the JavaScript side, you could go re you could slice out that section of the array, run it through a text decoder, and or encoder one of one of them. I, I'd have to think about it for a moment, but uh, run it through. The, I think the encoder uh, to turn it into an actual string. Uh, so this is a way you can do strings inside a WebAssembly. You will note that the hello function uh, returns a 32-bit number, and that number returns a zero, and that zero is saying look at location zero in the memory structure, in the shared memory. And so this is, in essence, returning a pointer. So in WebAssembly, unlike in Java, you can get actual null pointer exceptions as opposed to things that are just called null pointer exceptions. Have, have they updated that? I haven't done Java in a couple years. Have they called it a null reference exception yet? Is it still null point? It's still NPEs? And so... Um, but this is a way you could return a string from a function. You return its location so, and then go look it up. And so this is a lot of code to deal with strings, obviously. Um, uh, but that's uh, the state of, uh, of WebAssembly right now. 
Uh, there's a bunch of other capabilities. Uh, you've got this concept of local variables uh, within your, uh, your function, so you can define a local variable. Uh, sometimes that's useful. Um, you can just call set local, get local, and t local, which sets the value and returns it. Uh, you've got globals, which work a lot like shared memory, except they're of a distinct type. So here we're sharing a 32-bit um, value, a 32-bit integer that JavaScript and WebAssembly can access. But it's just an integer, and it's a named thing that's in the imports. Um, we got S expression syntax, which I'll show you in the demo. And we even got the uh, function tables. And this is so that um, you can create uh, function tables uh, that point to functions within the WebAssembly module. This allows you to do things like compile C++ code and have virtual functions. Or if compile C code and have function pointers. And so you can create this dynamic table of uh, functions and change it uh, programmatically. And those are things you might want to check out uh, more later. Um, so far, for uh, languages other than WebAssembly uh, uh, text format, which is, again, the hard way to do this, uh, C++ has got pretty good support through Inscriptum. Inscriptum? It's hard to say. But, um, and you can hand it C++, C and C++ code. It will spit out WebAssembly, HTML, and JavaScript to be an entire um, application. You can also use pieces of it to take LL, uh, is it LLVM or LVVM? Like, uh, take the bit code that you get when you compile C on, uh, on a Unix box and uh, turn that into WebAssembly. Um, it's got all these little pieces parts that are very useful for that kind of stuff. So um, it's got a lot of pieces parts though, and so it's a little difficult to navigate. Uh, Rust has really good support for WebAssembly. And I'll have a part of my demo will include a little bit of Rust uh, to show how you can uh, write a simple WebAssembly module in Rust and use it in a, in a web app. And uh, for anyone who uh, uh, does anything with, uh, in the Microsoft space, uh, you've probably heard of Blazor. Uh, Blazor is, um, well, basically, uh, Mono is the open source version of the uh, .NET uh, common language runtime. Uh, which is a virtual machine that runs uh, intermediate language. And so uh, what they've done is they took Mono and compiled it to WebAssembly. So you have a virtual machine on a virtual machine. Uh, yo dog. And that allows them to build uh, .NET applications that run in the browser, which is actually pretty powerful. Uh, I'm hoping this happens for the JVM as well. Uh, I'd love to be able to bring applets back. So those are things to check out. Uh, also, there's a site, Awesome Wasm Languages. It's just a Git repo where this guy is collecting assorted links to different versions, things people are doing at various stages of completeness. Uh, there's actually, on the site, there's a little egg icon. And you got an egg, uh, an egg with uh, the, the, ch the peep sitting out of it, and then the peep to give you an idea of how mature <laughs> the product is. So. Lots of experimentation in this space. Um, it's, very, it's pretty exciting. Uh, there's one tool I saw was uh, a, a Python interpreter. So a Pyth it was Python code that could read WebAssembly bytecode and run it. And so they were creating a WebAssembly uh, virtual machine in Python. And so lots, lots of neat stuff happening in this space. Let's do the demo. So I am going to live code in assembly language and you are going to laugh. So um, who else is familiar with Jasmine? For, as, okay, so I'm using JavaScript, I'm using, test driving this with JavaScript, and I'm gonna implement the, the uh, code in, in WebAssembly text format. Let's close uh, this FizzBuzz implementation. Doesn't exist yet. So um, in here I've got uh, this spec runner.html, which is just the thing that runs all my, uh, my tests. I've got a couple of helpers. I've got a spec helper that says random equals false. Normally, Jasmine would randomize your test order so that you don't have test dependencies between each other, because that's bad. Uh, randomizing it, setting it to false is better for a demo. So that's why I'm doing that. I've got a WASM helper here, which uh, uses the async await syntax in uh, ES6 to uh, fetch um, my WebAssembly module. And I'm actually using the, the slower, less uh, 
uh, the, the less desirable version in my code here uh, because I ran into a few problems early on getting the other version, Instantiate Streaming, to work on Safari. It probably works on it by now, but I just haven't updated my code yet. And this works well enough for a demo. So. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, let's start with uh, creating a new spec file, new file. Um, we'll call it fizzbuzz. So I'm going to implement fizzbuzz. But because uh, we can't return strings easily, I'm going to return numbers. And so fizz, uh, everyone's familiar with fizzbuzz, right? Uh, for, fizz, for things that should return fizz, I'm going to return negative 1. Buzz is negative 2. Fizzbuzz is negative 3. So describe fizzbuzz. There we go. And then before each, and then we need uh, the done, because this is asynchronous. This needs to be async. I'm not talking much as I type curly braces. Um, so uh, is it, was it fetch wasm? Load wasm. Load wasm. And then we want to load fizzbuzz.wasm. And we're going to await that. And then we're going to call done. And that lets Jasmine know, hey, this function's done. Uh, you can go ahead and start running the tests. So it returns minus one for multiples of, no, it returns, I'm getting it way ahead of myself, it returns the number it is given. That is totally not going to work. There we go. And so we can say expect this, oh, I forgot, this dot subject equals, we need a thing to test, dot fizzbuzz, and we'll pass in a one, and we expect that to be one. Is that readable and everyone, makes sense to everyone? Saying, hey, I give it a one, I expect a one. Easiest test in the world. So let's go ahead and spin up uh, Jasmine. So I use Python for my uh, web server because it's quick and easy and it creates a web server in that folder. And if I go over here and reload the page, it is uh, timing out because the WebAssembly module couldn't be fetched. Makes sense. That's an expected error. So that's good. Let's, uh, let's build a WAT, a WAT file, fizzbuzz.wat. So define our module. So this says, hey, it's a module. Always starts that way. We want to export the function called fizzbuzz, and it's going to be func $fizzbuzz. And that's all we need for there. Now, we could actually call this like FB and then it would map it, but I don't want to do that. And then we say func $fizzbuzz, and takes um, a parameter of i32, dot, um, type i32, and we're going to call it $n for number. And it has a result of an i32. And then all we need to do to make this pass is const is i i32.const1. So that's the absolute minimum to make this pass. Now, I've got two ways of compiling this. I actually have an a extension for Visual Studio Code, which will let me right click and say, save as Web, WebAssembly binary. And ask me what file I want. I hit enter. And now there's a WASM file here. And uh, if we open it anyhow, we'll see that, um, oh, well, actually, it, I didn't know it would do that. Um, one of the things that the, uh, the WASM uh, plugin gives you, or the extension gives you, is it will disassemble uh, your assembled code. And so this is my code that I just wrote, disassembled, uh, for our viewing pleasure. So uh, that should pass now, and it does. The other way we can compile this is, hang on, background it. 
And we can do, um, I have a little script here, wat-build.sh, and it's using, just using Wabbit, uh, and there's a wat to wasm. Uh, these things are so fun to say. <laughs> uh, and you just pass it the wat file, and it spits out a wasm file. It does exactly what it says it does. And so I've got uh, that set up as well. If I do dot slash wat build, that will also build a wasm file. And we can see that that still works. So uh, let's do the next test. Um, it needs to handle numbers other than one. So it returns other numbers it is given. So if we give it a two, we should get a two. We run our tests. We'll see that it does, in fact, not do that. It gives us a one because we hard-coded it to do that. Let's go in here, and we need to make this a little smarter. So instead of returning a constant value, we can call get underscore local, get a local value, dollar n. And that will get this parameter and push it onto the stack. I do the wet build, rerun my tests, and now it passes. Yes, we're going to do all the fizz buzz. <laughs> so let's do... Uh, uh, it returns, let's, let's do the fizz scenario. It returns minus one uh, when given a multiple of three. We give it a three, expect a minus one, run the test, watch it fail. So let's make this one pass. So uh, we've got something a little more sophisticated here now. Uh, we need to get the local value and say, is it equal to three? So to do that, we need to put a, we got the local value on the stack already. We need to add a constant that we want to compare it to. We're going to add three to the stack, so now we've got those two values there. We are going to call i32.eq, which says, are they equal or not? And so it pops those values off the stack and pushes in zero or not zero. And say if it is not zero, then i32 const minus one return. Otherwise, um, get local dollar n. So, um, if we come down this path, the if statement pops the value off the stack. And so once, if, it, if, if it's not triggered, our stack is empty. And so we have to push a return value onto the stack there at the very end. Now let's see this work. We're getting closer. So let's do um, other multiples of three. So we'll give it six, and we still expect a negative one. That fails in the expected way. We go into here. And so what we need to do now is instead of saying is it equal, we need to, we need to do a modulus, right? And so the way we do that is do remainder unsigned. So this pops those two values off the stack, divides them, and then puts the remainder on the stack. And then we need to say, is that equal to zero, EQZ? So that's going to then say, if the value is zero, then make it not zero. Otherwise, leave it at zero, or make it, leave it alone. Um, and then this should do exactly the same thing. This should totally work. It totally works. So, um, so far, the code hasn't been too terrible. I don't know that I would want to program in this all day long, <laughs> but it's kind of fun a little bit. It's kind of fun to get low level. Uh, let's, do, uh, let's do a negative two. I got six minutes. You don't have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to cheat and do two tests at once. And we're going to do multiples of five and other multiples of five. We'll do 10. Expect both of those to be minus two. 
compile, or no, we don't need to compile, we need to run our tests, watch that they both fail, and then in here, we can do this. Now, I don't always reuse code, but when I do, I copy and paste. Multiple of five, negative two, everything else is the same. So far, so good. This is the point at which you say, guy, you've got duplicated code, you need to refactor. So I'm gonna refactor. I'm gonna create another function called uh, is multiple of, it's gonna take a parameter of dollar n, it's an i32, it's gonna take a parameter of dollar div, and that's an i32, and it's gonna return a, a result of an i32. And what it's gonna do is these four lines of code. So we'll get local n, but instead of a constant, we now want to use uh, the, the argument. So we're going to turn that into div, and then everything else is the same. And then to call this, up here we can say, we need those two values, but we can call is multiple of, and we have effectively gotten rid of one line of code. <laughs> Uh, still passes, so we're good. Um, I want to show one other thing here, but I am running a little short on time. Uh, and there is this uh, S syntax where you can, this code gets kind of hard to read. And so what, you can use these S expressions to wrap these things up in parentheses. Whoops, that's definitely not a parenthesis. And it'll let you do things like this. That looks a little more manageable, doesn't it? That feels like I'm actually calling a function. And I could do the same thing down here. And if I compile, this should still work. And it doesn't. So, um, it, because because I'm copying and pasting, and this is why you don't copy and paste, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> there we go, now it still works. And so you can actually uh, transform the entire code set to work that way. I'm not gonna do that because I've got three minutes left. What I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna show you the Rust implementation of FizzBuzz. So this is basic Rust code. Uh, it does FizzBuzz. Um, if you don't know Rust, that's okay. You can probably still read it. It's, it's not very complicated. Um, and uh, I'm going to compile that. I've got a little uh, script here, and if you uh, go out to the repo uh, where I've done a lot of this uh, at the end of the talk, you'll be able to find this same code uh, to uh, use the Rust compiler to build it. I'm gonna build it really quick here. I've got this, the Rust dot slash Rust build dot sh. That creates a uh, fizzbuzz dot Rust dot rs dot wasm. I'm going to replace in here fizzbuzz.wasm with .rs.wasm and show that it still passes. So I've been able to swap out the Rust implementation, uh, the, 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 the WAT implementation with the Rust implementation, and it still works the same. If I go in and uh, break this implementation, say that, say multiples of five return minus 20, and build that, you can see that it actually breaks it, it's not just smoke and mirrors. And so, uh, yeah, that's my demo. Um, let me get to my uh, last slide or two, which I can totally do in a minute. Uh, so here's some resources uh, that I used uh, to learn a lot of the stuff. Uh, WebAssembly.org is the official place for all this stuff. Mozilla Developer Network's documentation for the JavaScript side of things is really excellent. I suggest you check it out. Uh, the Wabbit WebAssembly Binary Toolkit and the WebAssembly Toolkit for VS Code are both things I use to compile these. Uh, Rust and Inscriptum, I mentioned those already, and awesome WASM languages I mentioned as well. I'll leave this up until, you know, everyone's taking pictures, so I'll leave it up for just a moment. 
Um, here's uh, my uh, repos uh, at github.com slash guyroy slash intro to WebAssembly. You'll be able to find the slides and um, th these code samples. And I got an, like an enterprise FizzBuzz implementation that I did that took me four days uh, in this other repository. So I'm not joking. It, I wasted so much time on it. <laughs> I'm Guy Royce. Uh, thanks for attending my talk. <laughs>